Okay, so we've had a little hiatus, but uh, we're back. And um, I'm still in the uh, notes on survey syncing and the double square root equation. Notes number three, the PDF number three. And down in there, I'm on the PDF page 16, which has 187 at the, uh, at the top of it. Let's see if that's true. Yep, 187 at the top of it. So the point we had gotten to um, a couple weeks ago was that we'd worked through the geometry of a reflection in, um, in zero offset, I'm sorry, a reflection in constant velocity and in non-zero offset, and the, uh, the angles that are associated with that. So we defined some angles and their signs, actually. Uh, and we're shortening them with these, um, these letters uh, G, S, M, and H in capital. And each of these is uh, representing uh, the sign of an angle. And also, I think you can recognize from uh, your experience with Geology 706 that each of these uh, represents a wave number. It's really a wave number uh, divided by the frequency omega. So for instance, um, big G is V k sub G over omega. That's the wave number in the Fourier domain wave number spatial in the, uh, the, the uh, geophone coordinate direction. Of course, uh, geophone coordinate, the shot coordinate, the midpoint coordinate, the half offset coordinate, those are all um, on the same x-axis. We're in a 2D world here, just for uh, initial simplicity. And the, uh, the midpoint uh, coordinate, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the wave numbers that we're looking at uh, and it, their ratios with the frequency, they basically point out uh, central slices of our uh, 2 or 3D uh, um, transformed, uh, Fourier transformed wave field. So we have a 3D data volume. You know, its coordinates might be uh, uh, S, G, and time, source, receiver, location, and time. Uh, and each of those unique uh, triplets, each of the uh, unique pairs of source and receiver have, have one um, trace associated with them. Uh, alternatively, we could, we could have our data sorted into midpoint and offset uh, order. And, and what you've seen is just a... Uh, a re-slicing of the 3D data volume on an, on an angle that you can determine from the stacking chart. And um, if you Fourier transform in those horizontal directions, you'll end up with Km and Kh instead of Kg and Ks. OK, so uh, just to refresh your memories, um, the sign of the arrival angle, which I call gamma sub g here, OK, that's the, the uh, the direction the wave is propagating um, and its angle from the, uh, uh, from the vertical uh, of the propagation direction um, when it hits the receiver. Okay, that's the arrival angle. Uh, and that's the sign of that angle is equal to big G. Uh, the sign of the takeoff angle, that's the, uh, you know, whatever uh, little piece of data we're looking at, little, you know, reflection bump, uh, that we're that we're looking at. Um, where did that? What angle did that propagate again from the vertical, uh, away from the source, away from the vibrator, just be just below the ground? And the sign of that angle, uh, gamma sub s, is big S. And then there's these uh, sort of pseudo angles. Okay, when we move to the M and H uh, space, and the um, the sign of um, what you might, uh, you know, whenever you're looking at a zero offset section or a constant offset section, you see reflections and they're sloping. You know, they have a, a slope, an apparent velocity of, of distance m, midpoint distance, um, over, uh, over time. And, uh, or, or, you know, if, if we're using tau for the uh, zero offset time, it could be, you know, dm d tau, for instance. <clears throat> and we think of that as a dip because we know that 
uh, you know, at least we'd like to, or, or after migration, certainly, we can, um, we can interpret those slopes, those apparent velocities, as dips. Uh, of course, in a, in a time section, um, you know, we're using the term dip very, very loosely and, and incorrectly. So let's call that angle uh, theta sub m, and its sign is big M. And then, uh, you know, perpendicular to the, uh, to the constant offset sections, like the zero offset section, perpendicular to those are the common midpoint gathers. And they're in the, uh, in the offset, the, or half offset h direction. And the, um, uh, there's also a slope, an apparent velocity of an event. Uh, and of course, you know that uh, uh, those uh, reflections are hyperbolic in the, um, uh, in the common midpoint gathers. Um, but you look at any one, one place on that hyperbola, and you can find a slope. And you also will remember, of course, that at zero offset in a common midpoint gather, the, uh, the slope is, um, is zero. There's zero move out. There's infinite apparent velocity. And then in, uh, at least when velocity is uh, varying only with depth or, or is constant, the, the slope increase, well, the slope decreases the apparent velocity, um, uh, increase the apparent velocity uh, decreases from infinite down to some minimum. And that's, of course, the asymptotic slope uh, of the hyperbola, which is representative of the average velocity above the reflector. Uh, and so, you know, wherever we're sampling it, we're going to have a, an angle, which we'll call theta sub NMO for normal move out. Uh, and uh, the sign of that is big H. Okay, and you can see that GS, big, big G, big S, big M, big H, those are related to the wave numbers that we could pull out of a, um, out of a 3D uh, um, 4A transform of our, of our data set. Um, you know, they're a, they're a constant slope of wave number over, uh, uh, over omega, frequency, time frequency omega. Uh, and of course, omega, uh, like the, uh, the wave numbers, is a rotational frequency. So it's, you know, omega is 2 pi times the, uh, the frequency in hertz. All right, so we can cast our, uh, our downward, continuating, downward continuing wave equations in terms of GSMH, and it's particularly easy for um, uh, for uh, the the S and G domain, and so we have uh, you know the vertical derivative of the wave field, which is exactly what we need for downward continuing the wave field, right? You know, if we can determine the vertical derivative, then we just take one step, you know, we multiply that by z, and um, and we downward continue to that depth. So uh, it's uh, minus i omega over v, okay. And here we're not really addressing the issue of you know what happens when v is not constant. And that's uh, time the quanti that's uh, time this times this uh, double square root equation uh, in the brackets, the square brackets, and then times the wave field u, okay. So the derivative of the wave field is a uh, in the Fourier domain anyway, or in terms of these angles. It's a scalar times the uh, the, the wave field, uh, and for S and G, it's uh, just uh, the square root of the quantity one minus G squared, and then you add the square root of the quantity one minus S squared, um, and that's uh, that's all you have to do. A little more complicated in the uh, M and H domain. Um, you know, same uh, you get the same derivative. Uh, the wave field is just sorted into um, the uh, uh, midpoint and, and offset coordinates, uh, or midpoint and offset order. And so when you do your 3D uh, uh, Fourier transform, you're given um, you know, Km and Kh instead of Ks and Kg. And so we have these more complicated uh, uh, things in the double square root equation. And so what I began talking about, and I'll uh, refresh your memory maybe uh, later this week, about uh, splitting and separability. Um, the, uh, um, this, uh, uh, this operator in the 
in the M and H domain is neither splittable nor separable. Right? You can see with this, uh, say right here, uh, M plus H squared, right? You, you, you write out that square, and right there you've got terms that involve both M and H. So you can't uh, you know, accomplish your downward continuation. Um, you can't even do it uh, step by step, you know, a meter at a time downward continuing. You can't separate the, uh, the downward continuation at the midpoint versus the downward continuation using the, uh, the theta uh, sub n of Mohs, okay, with the, with the big H's. Um, so you have to do everything at once. And that's you know that can be computationally difficult, especially you know now that we're talking mostly about three D data sets, right? There would be there would be um, uh, uh, three dimensional uh, coordinates uh, in here. Um, we would have a uh, because we have uh, we could still have uh, k. Uh, we have two two directions of km uh, because our midpoints are spread out on a map. And our kh would also have to have uh, uh, two uh, derivatives because it's a, uh, a vector direction on a map for 3D surveys. OK. So um, the DSR is, is four-dimensional, the double squared operator. Um, it, it works on SGTZ or MHTZ. All right. And just like we took slices of our 3D data, OK, uh, which might be uh, P and SGT or, or uh, uh, P of uh, MHT. Um, and we could take a slice just by holding constant one of the, uh, one of the variables, you know, one of the axes. You know, we could take a slice at constant S, that's a shot gather, or a slice at constant G, a common receiver gather, a slice at con constant T. You know, that would be a, uh, a horizontal uh, constant time gather uh, or time slice. We could take a slice at constant m. That's a um, uh, that's a um, a common midpoint gather. We could take a slice at constant h, like a uh, a stack or a uh, a zero offset section. We can also take slices not just of the of the data, also of the operator. All right. How do we slice up a, a, a differential equation? Okay. Um, all we have to do is take something equal to constant. All right, and uh, uh, again, I, I want to repeat this uh, this assertion that Clairbout makes uh, in uh, uh, the Imaging the Earth's Interior book, which is a sec his second book from back in the '80s. All of the non-statistical aspects of seismic processing uh, that we use and that we still use, you know, 30 years later. They all fall out of this process. Okay. Um, uh, we, you know we have to uh, update to, you know, for the latest um, uh, reverse time elastic migrations, we have to update the wave equation. Uh, but we're still essentially downward continuing, and we're still using just a more complex version of the same double square root equation. Okay. So um, it's all here. And uh, it can be very simple. So let's try to let's try to take this uh, un, unsplittable uh, operator uh, in the M and H domain and slice it up. So let's set big H to be a constant and and particularly a constant equal to zero. So what does that mean? There is um, there is no. Um, no normal move out, right? That means uh, big H equals zero means that the uh, the sine of the NMO angle is is uh, is zero, which means the NMO angle is zero. And wh what offset do you find that at? At zero offset, exactly. So um, uh, that's a you know that's a that's a slice of the uh, of this operator that we're used to seeing. Okay, so really what we're back to is zero offset migration. So setting big H equal to zero reduces the DSR to this form, which is um, uh, rather similar to what we uh, uh, what we saw before. After simplifying it a bit, 
uh, we have uh, du dz is equal to minus i omega over v times the, uh, the dsr um, uh, uh, multiplied by the, the, the wave field u. And uh, the dsr is uh, the square root of 1 minus m squared. Right, the h has gone gone to zero, plus the square root of one minus m squared. So all we got is two of those, and we'll, we might as well put km back in there. We'll, so we'll substitute in um, vkm over omega, and look at what we have. Okay, this is precisely the familiar paraxial equation that we used in seven oh six for zero offset migration. We solved that paraxial equation in several ways. We, we, uh, we solved it with um, um, superposition migration, Kirchhoff migration. We solved it with um, FK migration, like Stolt migration, in the Fourier domain. We solved it in the, um, in the Fourier domain uh, with, um, um, uh, well, in the, uh, in the omega domain. Uh, but the uh, uh, the uh, m uh, the physical m and uh, and z domain with uh, uh, with finite difference migration uh, and I also showed you although you didn't do a lab on uh, on full um, um, uh, fully physical domain finite difference migration okay so you have many ways of solving this equation and so. Um, uh, now, and, and likewise, if you take any constant offset slice, you're going to find that, uh, that that theta NMO is also zero. Okay? In the, so zero, a zero offset slice is, is in, in this respect, you know, big H equals zero is also true of a non-zero offset constant offset slice. Okay, of the data or of the operator. So you have uh, several programs already that you can use to solve this, uh, this very equation. Um, uh, and, and which one you use depends a lot on your data and uh, depends on, on uh, you know, difficulties that you might have uh, uh, with uh, velocity variation. And you, you, uh, you know, whether you can get something useful out of a constant velocity migration, or, or whether uh, uh, you have to represent vertical velocity variation, or if you have to, uh, you even have a solution where you have thin thin lenses. In other words, slow um, lateral velocity variation um, that uh, doesn't scramble the wave field too much. Okay, so this is a a very familiar um, very familiar equation. And um, uh, because uh, notice that if you just substitute km uh, with uh, kx and uh, v over 2 to v, right, you get exactly the migrations we set up with, um, um, with the uh, um, in, in 706, okay, where we, we had to use the half velocity. And so here it is. There's the... Uh, there's the half velocity right there, and right there. So um, you know, there's even uh, uh, there's even some some equation here justifying that kind of ridiculous half velocity and, and exploding reflector model. All right. So, um, uh, but now we know that we can use very simple zero offset migration anywhere. Anywhere, big H equal to zero, we can use that anywhere that uh, there is no move out in the H direction, in the in the offset direction, on the CMP gathers. Okay, the uh, DSR, DSR operator is just uh, migration with the exploding reflector model. So that covers you know both stacking and migration. So how about that? Now let's explore something a little less familiar. Okay, what about big M equals zero? And this is going to turn out to be zero dip stacking. So this is this occurs if there is no dip. There is no move out in a constant um, constant offset section. 
And um, I'm sorry, I, th I should have said, let's see, for h equal to 0, that is, um, no, h equal to 0, that's, yeah, let's see. No dip in a, in a uh, m equals 0 is no dip um, in, a, um, in a 0 offset section, OK, or a constant offset section. And before, there's no move out. You know, with h equals 0, there's no move out in a uh, common midpoint section. Excuse me. All right. So the, um, in a 0 offset section, for instance, uh, or any, any constant offset section, the events are completely flat, OK? Horizontally layered earth. Okay, so what happens here? So let's let's reduce the DSR. All right, du dz is equal to minus i omega over v and times the DSR uh, t applied to the wave field u, and uh, and in the DSR, what's left with the big M equals zero is one the square root of one minus h squared, and then there's another square root of one minus h squared. So just like before. What we have now is minus i omega times 2 divided by v uh, times the square root of um, the quantity 1 minus, and then here is v squared k sub h squared over 4 omega squared. Okay, What is this operator? All right. Notice that it's, it's extremely similar to the very familiar uh, uh, zero offset migration operator that we saw before. Okay, um, and um, uh, and it's just applying. You know, it's it's basically applying the same equation in the other direction and keying off the case of H's instead of the case of M's. All right. So all right, let's look at some common midpoint uh, sections. Right. That's where you. That's where you have to look to get case of H. All right. And um, it's a uh, you know in, in when we're when we're migrating uh, uh, sections in two D uh, we're looking at constant offset sections when we're stacking sections in two D we're looking at common midpoint sections all right so if you um, if you have a bunch of hyperbolas in a common midpoint uh, uh, gather all right each hyperbola is going to have its apex at uh, zero offset along the time axis, and it's going to be asymptotic. You know, here I've tried to represent the hyperbolas as being asymptotic to uh, an increasing uh, uh, velocity with um, uh, with time or with depth. All right. So each of those. Um, um, so you know, what if I made a mistake and I uh, in and I was doing a two D um, you know, say a Stolt migration, okay, and instead of feeding it a zero offset or stack section, I fed that Stolt migration with a uh, with a common midpoint gather, like this common midpoint gather here with these three hyperbolas. All right. Well, each of these, and but I still give it the correct velocity. Okay. Well, each of these uh, uh, each of these hyperbolas is going to get collapsed to its apex. Well, okay. So there's a uh, variety of Stolt migration where you stretch the the time axis to uh, uh, to make a rough approximation. Okay, but okay. So let's feed it to a uh, a um, uh, uh, a finite difference migration. That we can that we can vary velocity. Right. We have that that v bar that horizontally average velocity that can that can do anything. So we can put in any well log we like, uh, and, you know, with very complex laterally, very complex vertically variable velocity, and and we could get a migration this good. Um, and what is it? You know, what's this width that I'm kind of suggesting here that each of these gets collapsed to? You know, that's the width of the Fresnel zone. Okay. And and this, in fact, is. Uh, an indication of where you get your your lateral um, um, 
uh, lateral resolution um, in the uh, um, after uh, migration, after stacking, after migration. Um, you know, it depends on the on the frequency of the uh, and wavelength of the wave. It would be a lot wider with depth, though, right? Yeah, especially with velocity increasing. That's correct. Yeah, yeah it should vary. And that's just the first, the first zone. Have we ever considered the second zone or which uh, which zone? Like the second Fresnel zone, we have multiple. Oh. We only consider oh. the first one. I haven't I haven't read about this this uh, second Fresnel zone uh, okay. principle. Okay. So. Uh, um. It's just much lower. It's another cutoff for energy. Uh, uh, uh. In other words, um, having to have the full lateral wavelength instead of a quarter of the lateral wavelength. I think so. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I haven't, I haven't you know, the reason, the reason, I, one reason I haven't heard of that is because um, I have these truly awful uh, continental and shallow data sets over alluvium, and so I tell everybody, hey, don't don't bother with the Wedes criterion at a quarter of the wavelength. Use the full wavelength. You cannot distinguish anything finer than the full wavelength, no matter what you're doing. So uh, uh, maybe I'm already using the second Fresnel zone <laughs> okay. because because my data don't justify you know cutting it any finer. All right. So uh, you know we we shove the uh, common midpoint gather through a through a migration, uh, maybe by mistake, and suddenly we realize that if we all we have to do is pick that zero offset trace. You know that 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 of course uh, completely ignores the Fresnel zone, right? And um, uh, and there, what we have is the same thing that would result from a conventional NMO and stack. You know, NMO correction to flatten the reflections, assuming you know the velocity correctly, and then you stack, okay, along along these hyperbolic paths, and that's what you would get, that uh, zero offset trace. Uh, it's interesting here, uh, uh, and this this has uh, come into play um, in in discussing uh, you know discussions of how to get velocity, how to estimate velocity, um, uh, in discussions of partial migrations like uh, dip move out, which I, I will not really cover uh, for you guys, um, in discussions of um, uh, of uh, uh, resolution. You know the the extent to which energy is left away. You know beyond the the Fresnel zones, beyond the wavelengths, the horizontal wavelengths in this uh, in this migration of a CMP. Okay, the extent that there's too much energy out there still, or or even you might even see uh, uh, you know under migrated uh, reflections. You know still still uh, uh, dipping down and you know, with some some normal move out left, you might see over migrated reflections that are smiling up. Okay, to the extent that happens, that's an indicator of of velocity error. And so everything, um, I think you guys are are getting used to the idea. But for others, this is a, especially for earthquake seismologists, this is a truly radical concept. All right, you have a process that depends on velocity. And you use that process to estimate velocity. Okay, um, and uh, and you can do that uh, iteratively. Um, you know, not even uh, inverting. So um, uh, maybe it's a radical concept, uh, but it's an extremely useful and well used, well proven tool. Um, you know, as you know, used every day. Um, and it gives fantastic results. So uh, you know we have here yet another criterion, yet another you know piece of analysis that depends very closely on the on the velocity in our, our velocity model, and it just gives us something else, another tool to use for velocity analysis. 
and velocity estimation. All right. So we've sliced the, uh, the DSR, the double, screwed, double square root equation, in two different directions, okay? Uh, in the, M, the, the M equal, big M equals zero direction and in the big H equals zero direction, all right? And let's see uh, uh, how it can represent the full flow of conventional processing, okay? I, I think you, you, you've guessed that already probably. So here's the full DSR in, in big M and big H, right? We got one minus the quantity um, M minus H squared, and, and over here in the second square root is the one minus uh, the quantity big M plus big H squared, okay? Um, we do downward continuation Fourier space with this, uh, uh, this operator here, um, you know, it's nice to be able to represent things in Fourier space because we can put the math on a page instead of having to do it uh, in a computer. Um, so we have um, that the uh, wave field downward continued to depth z is equal to the surface wave field, which is recorded at z equals zero, times in the Fourier domain e to the power of uh, i times v times omega over v times the DSR, which is up here, times z. Okay, so uh, we've seen that, that the source and receiver DSR is fully separable, okay? And again, I'll, I'll, I'll come back and I'll explain separability later on. Um, we want to, um, uh, you know, because we feel we need to define the operator in M and H coordinates, we've eliminated any possibility of splitting or separation, all right? So the, uh, the DSR MH has terms that look like this, you know, big M squared times big H squared. And, you know, for practical application, as I'll explain, you know, we got to have at least splitting, um, you know, or we're really, we're really constrained with these uh, big 3D data sets. We're constrained, uh, I mean, big 3D data sets from even simple 2D surveys, okay, in a 2D world. We get a 3D data set, and and so that you know we have to do everything all at once. We can't we can't split out any processes in any one direction. Okay, so let's let's find uh, an approximation to the full DSR in M and H, and we're going to call it the separable DSR, you know SEP, uh, and this is a little clear about joke here because. Uh, uh, SEP also stands for the Stanford Exploration Project, which was uh, Claire Bout's, uh, he had one of the first industry consortia uh, to support his work at, the, uh, at Stanford University. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what, he, what he did to his students was, was uh, say basically, and, and to the companies, would he say, you know, all the, the millions of dollars that you guys have put in over the years, um, uh, and I think the consortium ran for 20 or 30 years, uh, and and the uh, dozens and dozens of uh, masters and PhD students that have uh, worked on theses, all you're doing is exploring this uh, uh, this difference between SEP and DSR. Okay, so uh, in in one way it's kind of like uh, Clairbout was a uh, was a map was a mapper, and he's supposed to do a, a geologic map of the state. And every student gets assigned a, 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 a USGS quad, and basically, as time goes on, that gets filled in. So maybe it's the same sort of academic process. Of course, uh, uh, almost all of Clairbout students were brilliantly successful, uh, not only uh, getting great jobs in industry, even in very rough times for the industry, um, but also publishing academically. And he's had some of his graduates are some of the few people who have been able to um, to move easily, you know, from industry to academia because they kept publishing even in industry. Um, so there's many, uh, you know, many of my colleagues are terrific examples of, of that. Um, so uh, you know, I can't really knock uh, uh, Clairbout's plan here, um, and it, it centers around this SEP. All right. So we want SEP to equal the DSR 
for the end member cases where either m e big M equals zero or big H equals zero. So we can define it this way. All right, we're going to kind of take the SEP as the average of the um, of the DSR for big H equals zero and the DSR for big M equals zero. Okay, so the the way we concoct this is we take two plus the DSR for uh, big M for big M but big H equals zero and then subtract two and then plus the DSR for big M equals zero and for all big H and subtract two from that. All right, so uh, just plugging that in, plugging that through, SEP in M and H is equal to two times one, right, if, if one plus, and then here we have uh, the square root of one minus M squared minus one plus uh, the uh, square root of the quantity uh, 1 minus big H squared minus 1. Okay, um, So the SEP is different from the full DSR. Remember, the, the full DSR is, is for full downward continuation under this acoustic wave equation. Um, you know, not, it's not, uh, conceptually, it's not too big a leap to uh, take that to you know, full 3D elastic wave propagation even plastic wave propagation. Um, and uh, uh, so, so the uh, SEP um, is, differs from DSR only, only where both, both M and H are non-zero. So if either one is zero, your, uh, you, you, you know, the SEP is, is perfectly exact. It's not even an approximation. If either one is zero, big M or big H, if either one is zero, uh, the SCP is exact. Okay. Um, if um, and and you need the full the full DSR only where there is both where where there's both dip and the exploiter reflector model has broken down. Okay, so uh, when uh, at non-zero offset, okay, and velocity has to vary with x. Okay, anywhere that 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 both of those are not true, you can use SEP, standard processing. All right. Now, of course, you know in my work in the in the Great Basin and with these terrible you know, land data sets, shallow, shallow uh, terrestrial data sets, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, uh, both conditions are always true and, um, and, and worse than that. Uh, but, um, uh, um, but uh, it's, it's remarkable the range of conditions, okay, under which uh, you can use SEP. So, so you know, after finding out all this, all this stuff about, you know, uh, these these incredible simplifying assumptions that we have to make, okay, um, you know, you might be wondering, why does anybody stack? You know, why did stacking ever work 40, 50 years ago? Okay, but it did work in a lot of cases, and this is why. You really have to be out on a limb. You really have to be pushing the technique, um, you know, beyond the first 40 years of, of seismic surveying to need to go beyond standard processing. Okay. I mean, I encountered that early in my career, but uh, I could have made a career just doing standard processing. And I would be far richer than I am today. Um, so... Uh, um, there's, uh, uh, um, you know, really a, a very narrow uh, model space where, uh, and a very narrow data space as well, where you have to have those, uh, uh, anything beyond um, standard processing. Okay, so, so let's, let's restate SEP, um, which is here. Okay, at the top of the page, we've got 
SCP in terms of big M and B, big H. And here's what each of the terms of SCP is. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, you know, two times one, right? That that um, that constant out there is uh, basically time to death conversion. So call it TD. And this part of the DSR here, you know now, is uh, a zero offset migration of zero offset data. And we'll call this other part that depends on big H, big H, we'll call that NMO. Okay, that's NMO correction stacking, although you know put into a physical framework um, rather than a than a sort of operational framework. So you know we have migration of zero offset sections, and the, and NMO of H is migration of um, of uh, of um, uh, of common midpoint gathers. Okay, so you know that's that's how SCP is the standard processing sequence. Now, now notice that that SCP's terms are fully interchangeable. Okay, so in fact, uh, uh, you know why not do migration first? Okay, and that's in fact exactly what. Um, uh, what uh, pre-stack partial migration uh, is uh, dip move out. Okay, is doing the migration first and then doing the NMO correction and stacking. Okay, um, and that's usually followed by time to death conversion. You could do time to death conversion first. That's kind of the um, uh, the approach of uh, Kirchhoff migration um, and. Uh, and you could do, uh, you know, you could do, uh, you could do in whatever order you want, and you can you can take the results of one process and lock it away in a safe for a couple of years, and and uh, you know when your investors decide it's time, you can uh, uh, take it out of the safe and and complete another process. So um, they're fully splittable, fully separable. Okay, the terms are interchangeable. Um, uh, the, another implication here is that you can you can apply these different operations in in uh, uh, in a in, in whatever domain you want, Fourier or physical. So you could complete NMO in the um, uh, correction stacking in the physical domain, which is the way NMO is usually done. Then you could use an FK migration, right, uh, for a Fourier, uh, you know, doing doing the migration in the Fourier domain. And then you can come back to the time domain and do the uh, do the, the time to death conversion if you wanted to. Okay. Um, you could do all of these in the Fourier domain. You could do all of these in the time domain. Um, you can mix it up. Uh, um, you know, the migration, as you know, from seven hundred six can be. Uh, in the omega domain, but in the um, in the M and A in the M domain, um, the physical M and T domain. Um, so there's uh, you know this this the separability is 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 useful in all those ways. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about when big H is equal to zero on common midpoint gathers, as you know. DTDH, which is basically uh, the same thing as H, big H, that vanishes at uh, at H equals zero since all hyperbolas are symmetric about um, zero offset. Okay, about the time axis on common midpoint gathers for two D data. Okay. Um, now you could imagine uh, other situations. You know, maybe with very complex uh, velocity models. Uh, as you've seen, there are other places where move out disappears. Okay, in complex velocity models, and uh, so you know that means that big H equals zero. Um, uh, you know, any for any trace that's at the top of a hyperbola. Very interesting. K H over omega equal to zero. Also, you know. Makes uh, big H go to zero. All right, 
that implies that we're selecting kh equal to 0, which is an integration along a flat line in the CMP gather. Okay? So that's like, uh, uh, that's like doing the summation before applying any NMO. So that might be one way of uh, forcing, you know, what if you take your, you could do this even in the shot gather form. You could take your, um, your uh, shot gather, common midpoint gather, with hyperbolas all over the place, okay, a hyperbola, a, uh, hyperbola um, apexes everywhere, and you could you could just just sum it along horizontal lines, and the resulting stack that you would get, perf uh, you know, whatever's in that stack conforms perfectly to big H equal to zero, okay, and you're going to end up stacking in the Fresnel zones at the top of hyperbolas. Okay, where the arrivals are flat to within half a wavelength. So, uh, uh, you know that that uh, that could work if velocity that could actually show you something valid if velocity changes only slowly across the Fresnel zone. And and this is actually uh, I think one of the big reasons of that that uh, standard processing shows anything at all, because even in the presence of of, of all this interference. We're still getting whatever is at the top of those of those uh, hyperbolas. That's still going to come in correctly. So while we're looking at the effects of uh, big H equals zero and big M equals zero, um, you got to remember that taking one of those to be true does not necessarily mean that the dip is zero. Okay. Because of this effect, remember from uh, Clayton's analysis, all right, big M is equal to uh, sine alpha cosine beta, right? The sine of the dip times the cosine of the offset angle, and big H is equal to the sine of um, of the uh, the offset angle times the cosine of the uh, dip alpha. So B, big M can be zero at large offset. And big H can be zero at large dip. How about that? Um, you know, depending. Now, what about uh, downward continuation uh, in uh, in S and G space? Okay, and and we're you know this is an issue we're going to revisit. Okay, it's, it's basically uh, what I've worked on in in a lot of my career. You know, this is a heck of a lot of fuss, right? To uh, figure out why this uh, this uh, um, why this separable uh, um, standard processing sequence is worth anything at all I mean early in my graduate career everything I did was was to just dump the uh, the standard processing sequence and uh, forget about it and uh, and go to a full pre-stack migration okay um, and um, you know, I had a certain amount of success with that, but but uh, my results were were not very pretty. Okay, they were full of, of artifacts, and and you know, I realize only only recently that that what I'm doing is I'm 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 dealing with you know the the data sets of the time were were recorded. To give continuous and unaliased wave fields in the M and H domain. Okay, you know at that at, at that time of of exclusively two D recording. Okay, there was a because of the use of the standard processing sequence, there was real emphasis in the field on recording, you know, for midpoint and offset. the The stacking chart was the uh, was the the byline, you know, in the uh, uh, you know it was the it was the playbook. The playbook was a stacking chart when you were recording reflection data, okay, and and to some extent still is, okay, and the emphasis there is is on getting, you know, good coverage of M, good coverage of H, all right. So when you analyze a data set with you know full pre-stack migration in the S and G domain. 
you run into problems. If you're using a Fourier transform, uh, it's going to have discontinuities, and each of those is going to generate an artifact. If you, um, if you use a simple uh, uh, Kirchhoff migration, you're going to get a lot of truncation artifacts, a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of places where um, where reflectors appear to uh, to end, reflections end, but reflectors don't end. Okay, because of the way the data set was was acquired, and um, you know, there's other uh, uh, the other thing that that was happening to me in my career was that. Uh, I was ignoring where stacking and, and zero offset migration really are useful, okay? Because these, these processes, the SCP operator, is one of the reasons that it works is that it reduces the sensitivity of your analysis to velocities that you might not have defined very well, okay? And whereas I was using this, uh, you know, full... Um, DSR in, in big S and big, big G space that was totally sensitive to velocities and I didn't know them. Now, of course, that motivated Satish to come along and solve the velocity problem once and for all. Okay, and we'll talk about that. Uh, you know, so, so it took uh, a bunch of work to make the, uh, uh, to make, uh, you know, to get around this problem because the simple, you know, reduction in sensitivity uh, of the operators to velocity, um, the simple ways of, of being able to get velocity, you just can't get them with the DSR and S and G. You really need that M and H space for estimating velocity until Satish, all right, and his uh, his velocity optimizations. So, um, uh, you know, really, uh, it it. It hindered uh, acceptance of, of my early results, you know, going into S and G space, and then inspired uh, smart people like uh, like Satish to uh, uh, to get around it once and for all. So uh, that's uh, that's my story. <laughs>